Hello, and welcome to this video discussing Federalist Paper Number 70. Um, Federalist 70 was written by Alexander Hamilton to defend the presidency as it was envisioned in the proposed Constitution of 1787. Uh, just to establish the context, the United States under the Articles of Confederation didn't really have any kind of executive officer who would make sure that what the legislator, legislature wanted to happen would actually happen. Uh, and this was one of the reasons why the U.S. government had a hard time actually getting anything done under the Articles. Now, in the 1780s, most Americans' understanding of the idea of a government executive would be based on either the governors of their colonies and then states or on the kings of European nations. Um, so it's understandable that many Americans, still recovering from a war to escape the power of one king, would be afraid of creating a new position that would be a king under a new name. Hamilton's fear, on the other hand, was that the Americans would have fought a war to govern themselves and then prove unable to do so. So he was much more comfortable with executive power than many of the other framers. Passing a law is not like casting a magic spell. Once the law is passed, somebody needs to take action to make sure that people actually do what the law says they're supposed to do. And if no one takes that action and people ignore the law, then for practical purposes, it's like the law doesn't actually exist. Therefore, Hamilton argues a strong executive is necessary. And so then he establishes four characteristics that make an executive strong. They are first, unity. There's only one person with the executive power. Hamilton didn't want a committee that would have to agree on every decision. He wanted a single person who would be responsible for making the final call. Second is duration. The executive has to have enough time to get the job done. If the executive can be replaced every year or two, the executive might not have time to see decisions through and learn the job well enough to do it well. Third, the executive needs adequate provision for its support. Now this means that the executive has the resources to do the job in terms of the executive's own compensation and the money and staff needed to carry out the work. Just for starters, you probably don't want the chief executive opening every piece of mail that comes in. So you're gonna to need to hire some help and give them all space and tools to do their jobs. Finally, fourth, the executive needs competent powers. The executive has to have the authority to take action, and people have to have reason to do what the executive says because there will be penalties if people don't listen to the executive. Now, even Hamilton doesn't want the executive to become a tyrant or abuse power the way that many Americans felt King George did. To avoid this, Hamilton felt it was necessary to make the executive accountable to the people in some way. Not necessarily by a direct election, but through some mechanism that ultimately rests on the people having their say. So if people vote for their state legislatures and then the state legislatures choose a chief executive, that would still meet this requirement for Hamilton. Now the second thing that would restrain the power of the executive is that it must be clear to everyone exactly why the executive has this power in the first place. What responsibilities does the executive have? To maintain peace, prosperity, the rule of law, if the people are going to have to decide whether the executive is doing a good job or not, they need to know what the job is, and they need to be able to figure out if the job is getting done. So that's both the powers and the limits that Hamilton thinks the executive needs. The remainder of Federalist 7 argues primarily for point one about unity of the executive. Hamilton argues that if you divide the executive power among a group of people or make the executive responsible to a group of people, then the group of people are going to have difficulty com coming to decisions. They will argue amongst themselves and have different priorities, so they will not be able to take action when action is necessary. And he points to several examples throughout history where attempts to share executive power have led to conflict or poor decisions or even both. Further, when multiple people have executive power, there are multiple people to take credit and blame for events that occur. And that means the public has a harder time deciding who to reward and who to remove from office because they won't know who's actually responsible for whatever they want to reward or punish. And the executive, if the executive knows they won't be held responsible or accountable, one of the key safeguards against abuse of power by the executive goes away. So um, by Going over this history and by going over these problems, uh, Hamilton is arguing that we need a president. We don't need an executive council. We don't need a board of advisors or a board of directors. We need a president, a chief executive. Uh, and uh, you know, ultimately, uh, the, the people in favor of the Constitution 
won the day and the Constitution was ratified and we have a president. Um, so uh, I think that if you want to evaluate Hamilton's argument, it would be good to, to take a look at the power of the presidency today, uh, see whether the president is held accountable uh, and whether uh, the, the structure of the presidency uh, does lead to effective action and effective decision making. Um, so until we uh, meet to discuss uh, another essay or another paper, uh, thank you for watching.